from the Toronto Star. I'm Rudji Mudder, and this matters. It has been four years since the bodies of Barry and Honey Sherman were found murdered in their Toronto home. The shocking killings of this incredibly wealthy couple was a huge story, but since then, the police have made no arrests in this crime. In a press conference last week, Detective Sergeant Brandon Price of the Toronto Police Homicide Squad gave an update and some details about the scope of their investigation. So far, the investigation has involved 41 judicial authorizations, approximately 250 witness interviews, 1,255 tips have been provided to the police from the public, 992 investigative actions have been undertaken. The police have also canvassed and collected video from the area on the night of the murder, and now have asked for the public's help to find someone they deem suspicious. We have been able to eliminate the vast majority of people captured on the video. We are left with one individual whom we have been unable to identify. Through our investigation, we have been unable to determine what this individual's purpose was in the neighborhood. The timing of this individual's appearance is in line with when we believe the murders took place. Based on this evidence, we're classifying this individual as a suspect. Unfortunately, it is a short clip with very little identifying characteristics, other than the distinctive walk of the person in question. This is another astonishing development in a story that already is full of intrigue, family drama, and many unanswered questions. Kevin Donovan is the star's chief investigative reporter. He's been following the murder of Barry and Honey Sherman since it occurred four years ago and wrote a book about the crime called The Billionaire Murders. He is also following the story's recent developments and joins us once again to share an update. Kevin, thanks so much for once again making the time for This Matters. Thanks for having me on. So Kevin, there is a bunch of stuff I want to talk about, and especially with this story, which is so crazy. I think we have to start off with the fact that the four-year anniversary of the murders just passed, and then there was an update given last week. The police actually gave information about a new suspect, the man with the strange walk. You've been investing in this case as doggedly as anyone. I want to know, what was your reaction when you saw this video and the police gave this information? Well, I was shocked, surprised, pleasantly at first, because the police have been very, I think, negligent in providing information to the public. And when it came out, I had been told that there was going to be some video released, but I thought it would be video of perhaps Barry and Honey's last known movements when they left Apotex that Wednesday afternoon. But in fact, it's a video that they collected of a person who has an odd gait, as the detective described it, to the back right of the foot, the right foot, the, the heel kicks up as the person walks. Police say they don't know if it's a man or a woman. I think it's a man looking at it. Looks a bit portly. Don't know if the clothes have been stuffed a bit. Just walking along the road around the Shermans at the time of the murders. So this is a stunning development in this case. The police are now looking for this person with the strange walk. It reminds me a little bit of The Fugitive and The One-Armed Man or Kaiser Soze in The Usual Suspects. Of course, those were both fictional. In all seriousness, Kevin, how did the police find this video and zero in on this suspect? Yeah, it was very interesting. The first thing is when I saw the video, there's a fire hydrant in it. I knew that was not the fire hydrant that is just outside of the Sherman's home. So then I enlisted some of our helpful readers. I was in the newsroom writing a story and was going to go up to the scene later that day, but had some people I know drive the area and they reported to me that the actual place where this was shot was on a street about 1.3 kilometers to the east of the Sherman home. And when I walked that route that night, this person probably walked about four kilometers in total that night coming in from the east from Leslie or if the north from the 401 travels west or south to the Sherman's home. The police say the person stays in that area around the Sherman home for a suspicious period of time and then leaves going the same route. The police have, through a court process I've been involved in on behalf of the Star, released a bunch of documents to me over the last week. And I noticed that, and here's the quite interesting thing, police have been on to this person since almost day one. They didn't tell the public, they didn't ask the public for assistance until last week, but they had this person in their sights as a suspect from pretty close to day one. Okay, that's super interesting. They actually said this person is a suspect. That's stronger than person of interest, right? So they're potentially somehow involved. Why was there such a delay in letting the public know if they're looking for this person? 
Well, and I think the police only released this because they knew we were about to get it through this court process. But putting that aside, the police are always saying we can't release any information because we don't know what the suspect or suspects know and don't know about our investigation. I think that's wrong. I might use some stronger language to describe that, but it is the holiday season. The police have gone to a tremendous amount of effort over the last four years to try and figure out who this person is. They've released this information, they say, because they've just given up. They don't know who the person is, and they hope that somebody from the public will know. I can tell you that within two hours of this press conference, I had six doctors with some experience in the mechanics of the human body calling me to say, that person has drop foot. And apparently drop foot is where you pick up one of your feet in this manner, and it's a neurological condition. Now, I mean, my wife was looking at it this morning again, and she said, maybe the person's got something stuck on his foot, which is possible. If you really study the video, it almost looks like the person has something in the left hand because the left arm is really not moving. It's like it's holding something. But the problem with these videos, like all video shot from home security at night, you really can't make all the details out. The person is between roughly 5'6 and 5'9 and 3 quarters, but that's all we know so far. Okay, Kevin, obviously this is like sort of reinvigorated a insane case, but I want to move back a little bit now. You know, this case has been going on from four years. You've gotten all these new documents about it. I want to talk a little bit about this. And look, you've been part of this the whole time. Right off the top, it just sounds like the police just did not move quickly enough in this investigation. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say. And the more documents that are released through this court process, and these documents for our listeners are documents that are, they're called ITOs, Information to Obtain police go to get a search warrant or a production order for cellular phone records and they have to provide a quite a hefty document to the court to get a judge to approve it and these documents are now each one of them about 250 300 pages long and so when i now look at them i see that the police don't even start a serious video canvas until about january 20th and that's five to six weeks after the murders and that's when they start getting all this video the police don't collect dna in fingerprints to exclude people who would naturally have been in the house. They don't do that for about nine months. There's a litany of mistakes that I've found. And it's interesting, Justice Pringle of the Ontario Court of Justice, who is the one who hears the STARS applications, she said every time that it is very good that the Toronto police are being scrutinized by the media, by the Toronto Star and myself in particular. It's helping. And I'll tell you that at the press conference last week, a homicide detective, quite a senior one, said to me, keep on lighting that fire under us. We need it. Absolutely fascinating stuff. You've done so much work on this thing. You know, one of the things in the documents, I think it's the detail a little bit about how cell phone tracking has been used in this investigation. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you've learned about, I guess, what they've learned? I've learned a fair bit, Reggio. I have a lot more to learn, but I'll tell you what I know so far. When we have a cellular telephone and it is turned on, it pings off of cell towers in our area, in the area that you're moving. And it's not an exact science, but it's becoming quite close. So what the police have done, as far as I can tell, at least in the year 2018, they have asked for permission and received it in most cases to look at about 50 cell phone numbers. And these are people that are Sherman family members, Sherman friends, Sherman business associates. They put together a bunch of numbers and then they've gotten permission to look to see where that phone was at the time of the murder. What they have not done yet, and I've just learned this in the last 24 hours, what they haven't done in 2018, and by the way, I don't know what they did in 2019, but in 2018, they've not put a box around the Sherman home and asked to see what other cell phones were there. And that is apparently technically possible. It's not that hard to do, but it's a harder bar to cross to have permission to do that from the authorities. I don't know if they got that. I think I'll find out if they did in the next two weeks because I'm going to be getting some more information. But just to clarify, you've got police looking at numbers that they know to see if they're in the area. What I don't know is did they look for other numbers, people that they don't know about, and one of them would be our potentially Kaiser Sose person just wandering around in the area of the Sherman home in certainly a very suspicious manner. Okay, well, that obviously would be adding more to this story. 
Now, here's the thing, Kevin, you've also gotten a bunch of stuff about the initial investigation, and obviously there's a lot of scrutiny on this family because they're billionaires. At the time, there seemed to be a lot of, I guess, suspects and finger pointing, right, in the interviews with the police. What can you tell us about that? Yes, in these ITOs, these search warrant and production order requests, police present to the justice witness interviews, and they present those interviews not so that somebody like me can read them, but so that the judge can see this person X is saying this, giving this suspicion about person Y, and that's why we need to have that person's cell phone records. So what I have are all these sometimes redacted, sometimes not redacted documents interviews with the four Sherman children, for example, some aunts and uncles. Each one of them is asked by the police near the start of the investigation, who would have done this to Barry and Honey Sherman? And the four children in particular provide a number of theories. They, As far as I can tell, they name two or three individual men and say that those people were involved. I've chosen for now not to identify those people. They're not identified in the documents because of redactions. I know who they are. Just to help everybody know how deeply we go into this, I've checked into these three people to see if they have an odd way of walking. They don't. And if they are the right height of our mystery person, they are not. That They're all taller. So each of the Sherman children and at least one aunt, Aunt Mary, say that person X is responsible. And then the police have set off over a period of at least a year to see what their alibis were. I think the alibis all checked out. And so what those Sherman children and family members were suggesting didn't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I really want to get to the family because I think there's immense interest there, but I do have to stop and make this one point. This is one of these things that says something about this investigation. Kevin, through the documents, you know, it says that basically one of your stories in the star prompted the police to interview a pathologist that was hired by the Sherman family. Two questions about that. Tell us a little bit more, but two, how'd you feel reading about that? Because it does say you are lighting this fire, right? Yeah, and it's something that I think we've always known. So what happened was the Sherman bodies are found on Friday, December 15th of 2017. And then the star assigned me a few weeks later to look into the case. And it's obviously an assignment that I'm not finished with yet. What I find quite quickly is that with the second series of autopsies that the Sherman family arranged and paid for, they hired quite an excellent pathologist, Dr. David Chason, who was Ontario's top pathologist for many years. And he looks at the bodies a few days after the police pathologist looks at the bodies and determines it's a double murder. And you'll recall that at the time it was rumored that this was a murder-suicide, that Barry had killed Honey and then taken his own life. The second pathologist looks at crime scene photos, looks at the bodies, and comes to, I think, the correct determination. But nothing happens. The family does not pass this information on to the police. I, through my sources, get this information, and we publish a story, I think five weeks later, on January 19th, saying that the Shermans were murdered. And that causes a big splash in the policing world, and certainly in the Toronto police. And the next morning, that's when the Homicide Squad gets really involved in this case, and that is when they order this canvas where they collect the video. So all we are, journalists, really are conduits for good information from people. I just don't know why the Sherman family never told the cops what they had learned. Okay, that's a perfect segue. You've written about the family. You've talked to the family. You've reported about how frayed the relationships are between them. Part of this is because... Jonathan, the son, has said to you that other family members have thought he is somehow involved. Can you tell me now, is there any update on the family right now? The family, like the four children who had some had spoken to me before, haven't for a while. Like, I hope they will again. I'm certainly open to that. The only update I can provide, and that's from these documents, the police are, from their point of view, they don't know who the Shermans are. They're trying to find out, so they're asking a lot of questions. And what they're learning is that there has been, over the years, a lot of tumult in the Sherman family. Sometimes the kids didn't get along with their parents. And one of them describes Honey and Barry as the swearing and screaming type, which I'm surprised at, actually, because I've not heard that before. And so it's not a happy household. And then when this terrible event occurs, 
it brings them together in a unified force for a while. But then, as you pointed out, what happens is that at some point, and this is according to Jonathan, the son who I've interviewed, he said that then his sisters are not talking to him now. And it's because one of the sisters, Alexandra, this is Jonathan telling me this, thinks that he had something to do with the murder. Now, Jonathan hotly contests, says this is not true. He loved his parents. He had a great relationship. And so that's where I'm at with that line of questioning right now. Kevin, I think the other thing we have to talk about is like up until recently, there had been very little to no news or movement on this case. I mean, if it came, it was because of your work. You actually cross-examined the lead investigator, I think maybe about a year ago. And at that time, I believe they had said that it was still an active investigation. They had a theory of the case. Now, I'm just curious with these revelations of this new suspect and your own investigation, how does it all fit? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that because I was thinking on this over the last couple of days since I've seen these documents. The police, I've cross-examined the detective, I think, five times so far, another one coming up at some point next year. And starting about a year into the case, the detective said they had, quote, a theory of the case and, quote, an idea of what happened. I now believe that this mystery person, that's the theory of the case. That's what the detective was referring to. I do not think he had a specific person in mind. His theory of the case was that a mystery person went into the Sherman's home, murdered them, and then left. That's the theory of the case. And the problem with that theory is they've not been able to put a face to this individual. There are other images of the person in the search warrant documents, but they're for the moment redacted. The police say that the one that we all saw last week, the press conference, that's the best they've got so far. I'm hoping to get them unsealed so I can see if they're telling the truth. Okay, so where are things at right now? I mean, obviously the search is on for the funny walking man. I believe police are getting tips. What can you tell us? The police told me on Saturday that because of the video release, they have been getting dozens of tips. I'm thinking they're probably similar to the ones that I'm getting, where people are calling and suggesting that, I don't mean to make light of this, but people do have grudges against people and people are calling up to say so-and-so is the mystery man. Hopefully the police are getting something more concrete. They are struggling on this case because they really are relying on the public in this case, to say, I saw somebody on December 13th, and I'm just hypothetically, but I saw somebody that looks like this getting on a bus and heading to Pearson or something like that. That's what I think they're looking for, and I don't think they've got that far yet. You know, your first story after this, it was in the press conference, and someone asked the cops whether this was a Hail Mary. Is it one? I think it was a Hail Mary. I think that reporter was very astute, and here they were, as we now know, four years later, They've got this image of this person. They've had it for a long time. I never heard a whisper about this. And they probably should have put this out a lot sooner because people get busy, memories fade. The time to put this out would be, I would say, soon after you discovered it. And here we're all expected four years later to remember this. And what's also interesting is that I've interviewed people on that street and The police say in these documents that they showed these images around. I haven't found a single person who was shown this image of the person. And so it's frustrating. Hindsight is 2020. But for me, looking at this, I think it's another example of a delay that has become a big mistake. But I will say this, knowing what I know about this person's behavior, I understand why the people think The person's a suspect because the person goes right up to the Sherman's property, disappears from any video that's around there, and spends probably a couple of hours there and then leaves. That is very, very suspicious. This is not a man out walking his dog. Something happened that night. Kevin, I think this has been fantastic for us. What do you want to find out next, and what information are you looking for for this investigation? Well, I want to know if the police did go to the effort of trying to locate unknown cellular phone numbers in that area. You look at the person, the way he or she is walking, I think it's a he, and might be a cell phone in that left hand. I want to see if there was a phone. It would be a throwaway phone, I'm sure. But did they go to that extra effort beyond the numbers they knew to look for the numbers they don't know? And that's the next step for me. Kevin, this has been fascinating. I want to thank you so much for your work and your time today. Thanks. Kevin Donovan is the Star's chief investigative reporter and also the author of The Billionaire Murders. 
That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Raju Mudder. Our This Matters team is Brian Bradley, JP Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bockneck, Saba Etizaz, and Sean Pattenden. Our music is by so-called Mike DeAngelis and Sean Pattenden. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.